Well, it's a, <clears throat> an honor for me to be here this morning. I, uh, I want to share with you a message that I, I share with uh, corporations, um, but it's also a message that has had a significant impact on my life, and hopefully it will be as meaningful to you uh, as it has been to me. Several years ago in the Orlando Centennial, there was an article that said only 5% of the population has a clearly defined strategy or mission for their lives. It says the other 95% seem to just drift through life. They live reactively. They react to the circumstances that they're presented, presented with each day. They went on to say they have no plan to make life conform to their dreams, their goals, their mission in life. And it struck me, I think this is why so many people, when they get to the end of their lives, experience one of the most painful emotions that a person can experience. And that's the, the pain of regret. A life that could have been. There's a book that came out two years ago called Life is a Gift, written by Bob and Judy Fisher, a couple that lives in Nashville. And they interviewed 104 people who were in hospice. They were all dying. In fact, of the 104 people they interviewed, none of them lived six months after the interview. And one of the things they noted was this recurring theme that would come from the lips of each of these people. And we'll quote from the book. So many realized too late there was a significant gap between the things they ought to be doing with their lives and the things they actually did. And to me, that's a perplexing question. Why do you think, and I see it all the time, why do you think there are such great discrepancies but what we, for what we desire in our hearts and what we end up doing with our lives? And so this is why I want to speak to you for a few minutes this morning on a message I call A Life of Personal Excellence. And this is an issue I've always been intrigued by or intrigued with since I heard these words by Vince Lombardi, the famous legendary NFL football coach, when he said the quality of a person's life is in direct proportion to his or her commitment to excellence. And I don't know about you, but the thought of a life of excellence has great appeal. It even sounds kind of noble. But what does it really mean? What is it? Well, the word excellence comes from two Latin root words, which means to rise out from. So excellence, therefore, means the quality of rising out of one's potential. We're talking about the potential and abilities God endowed us with. So in essence, what we're talking about is a stewardship issue. To be the very best that I can be in every area of my life. This idea is not new. Socrates addressed it 2,400 years ago. He said, we have been deceived into thinking that success and wealth will bring excellence into our lives. But in reality, he says, personal excellence will result in success and wealth as well as all other public and private blessings in life. Now what I want to do very briefly is share with you three principles to lay out my, my presentation. And the first, I think, will help point us in the right direction as we consider this life of personal excellence. And this first principle you may be familiar with because I first heard it from a man who lives here in Atlanta, Andy Stanley, a pastor here, and he calls it the principle of the path. You may be familiar with it. I believe this principle is of unbelievably critical importance if you want to lead an exceptional life, if you want a life of excellence, and the principle of the path is simply this. Everyone is on a path right now, whether you realize it or not. And that path is taking you towards a certain destination. Now stay with me, because though this is a very simple principle, it's very profound. He says, the path you are on is not a respecter of persons. It doesn't care who you are. 
It leads where it leads regardless of how talented you are, how wealthy you are, and how important you are. And the principle of the path is operating in your life every minute of every day. For instance, every single person in this room is on a physical health path. We are. And it's taking us in a specific direction and it will in all likelihood impact the length and quality of your life as the years go by. Your marriage is on a path right now and it's going in a certain direction. If you're like me, you're still raising children. I'm on a child rearing path. And one of the things that I have come to realize is that the path we're on is going to have a huge impact on how my children turn out. We're on a financial path, an intellectual path, a moral path, a spiritual path. And your business is on a path right now and it's going in a certain direction and it's going towards a certain destination. And the path that I'm on always determines where I end up, always. Which leads us back to where I, where I started. We all seem to have the propensity of choosing paths that don't seem to lead us in the direction of a life of excellence, a life that flourishes, a life that we dream of. Why is that? Well, I think there are three reasons. And I want to share those real, real quickly. The first is, it's, cru it's so crucial to know, is that in the midst of decision making and setting priorities, we lean hard on our intentions and dreams, but pay very little attention to the direction of the path that we've chosen. Good intentions will never get, it, get you anywhere. At the end of the day, it's the direction your life is going, not intentions, that will ultimately determine your destination. Back in uh, July of 2010, there was a great article in the Harvard Business Review by a guy written by the name of Clayton Christensen. He was a Rhodes Scholar. He teaches at Harvard Business School. And listen to what he said. He said, over the years, I've watched the fates of my Harvard Business School classmates from 1979 unfold. I've seen more and more of them come to reunions unhappy, divorced, and alienated from their children. I can guarantee that not a single one of them graduated with the deliberate strategy of getting divorced and raising children who would be estranged from them. Yet they went down a path that led to this consequence. You hear what he's saying? Is Nobody gets married with the intent of getting divorced. The problem is, he says, we get on paths that take us in that direction. In his brand new book that's just come out, he offers this great insight. He says, in my experience, high achievers focus a great deal on becoming the person they want to be at work and far too little on the person they want to be at home. <clears throat> a second reason. Modern people are not on a truth and wisdom quest, but a pleasure and happiness quest. And therefore, we are so often guided by our feelings and not good judgment. As I've told my children, the path that leads to excellence is generally the most difficult. But if we persist in going down those difficult paths over time, they become easier. Not because the nature of the task has changed, but our ability to do them has increased. I'm sure you're familiar with Jack Welch who back in the 1980s took over GE as CEO. It was a dying dinosaur of a company. And he transformed it into one of the world's great corporations. There was one guiding principle that guided his life and his business. And I want to read it to you. Quote, the key trait of a vital, dynamic corporation is looking reality in the eye and then acting upon it with as much speed as possible. You know, this is true not only of a corporation, you can plug in any name you want. The key trait of a vital dynamic person, a vital dynamic marriage, is looking reality in the eye. We all simply believe that if you are committed to the truth, you will run straight at your problems as fast as you can. He says you face the truth and you act. But we're more into feeling good. We don't like painful confrontation. We don't like dealing with difficult issues. 
The third reason we don't get on a path that leads to excellence is that we live in a culture, more so than ever before, that's always looking for shortcuts. We think we can do this with easy techniques and formulas. All you have to do today is go to any Barnes and Noble, and if you have a problem, they have a book that will fix it quickly. Five easy steps to double your sales. Six secrets to completely eliminate stress from your life. I heard one on CNBC the other day, easy stock trading techniques to make you great wealth. And notice, they're always easy, easy steps. I see this when I counsel someone who comes to see me who for years has created all kinds of problems in their personal life, their marriage, their business, and they're hoping that one 40-minute counseling session will solve all their problems. But you see, life doesn't work that way. There is an art to living this life, and it's not a quick and easy formula. The ultimate outcome of your life is determined by the path you go down, and every path has an ultimate destination. So what's a person to do? Now, I realize I may be talking with a group of people whose lives are flourishing in all areas. But if that's not the case, what do you do? How do you get the life you want from the life you're leading? I think you start with what Jack Welch said. You've got to look reality in the eye. As one wise man put it, we need to stop deluding ourselves and admit that maybe I'm not on the right path in certain areas of my life. Maybe I've gotten lazy in certain areas of my life. I read this about President George Bush. It says, George W. Bush drank too much. He stopped. He would not have been president had he not stopped. It's that simple. You see, I don't care who you are. We all have flaws. We all have deficiencies. And the people who achieve excellence in this life ruthlessly study themselves seeking to bring their flaws under control, which have all kinds of spiritual ramifications, as you can imagine. My second thought comes from John Maxwell. He says this, You will never change your life until you change something you do daily. You will never change your life until you change something you do daily. And a good way to illustrate this is the second principle that I want to introduce. It's called the vector principle. I'm going to have to shorten it a little bit for time's sake. I shared this message with one of the largest, the management team of one of the largest construction companies in our country, uh, Brassfield and Gorey. And Miller Gorey says, this is the key principle to change your life and to change what's going on in your company. Vector is a term in mathematics and physics that quantifies the speed and direction of an object. If you were the pilot of a jetliner, you would use vectors to define the course to your destination. When you are given a new vector by the control center, you turn the plane to line up with that heading on the compass, creating a new vector angle. Obviously, even the smallest vector can change in the cockpit, a change in the cockpit can make a big difference in the plane's ultimate destination. Though it may seem an imper imperceptible change with every mile travel, you are further from your previous course. For example, you could make just a very tiny vector change while flying between New York and Seattle and end up in Los Angeles instead. The vector principle applies to our lives in the same manner. Even if you never fly an airplane, you are vectoring through life by the choices you make. You are currently on a path that was determined by choices you have made since you are aware of your capacity to choose. Many of these choices seem rather insignificant at the time, Listen to this, but small changes make a big difference over time. Small changes make a big difference over time. There's a, a, a business consultant by the name of Nito Quabin, very prominent man. He's made this observation. He says, one of the greatest reasons people cannot mobilize themselves is that they're always dreaming of some grand accomplishment that they hope one day will come to pass. But it never does. And then he says this, most worthwhile achievements are the result of many little things done in a single direction. I was reading about Abraham Lincoln's approach to winning the Civil War, one of the greatest leaders of all time. 
And it said Lincoln realized that the attainment of a successful outcome had to be accomplished in small steps. So he constantly set specific short-term goals that his generals and cabinet members could focus on with intent and immediacy. You see, this is the way companies, the way organizations see continuous improvement take place within. Small changes that need to be made that become a permanent part of your culture. You know, I look back over my life, probably the, the most significant, and I don't know if you'd call it small change, but the, one of the most significant changes I ever made was 35 years ago when I was waking up, getting up about 6.30, muddling my way around, getting to work by 8, and making the decision to get up during the week at 5.15. It's amazing what you can do in those early morning hours if you're willing to get up. It changed my life. So I challenge you, examine your life. Look to make maybe one or two incremental changes that you can make. Stick with it until it's a permanent part of your life. And then move on and focus on something else. I promise you if you do, it'll make a huge difference in your life, in your company, with the passage of time. You see, it's like compound interest. When you make a change, it's like compound interest as, the time go, as time goes by if it becomes a permanent part of your life. The final principle I don't have time to read to you. Uh, this message is 45 minutes. It's recorded. You'll find it back on one of the tables if you're interested. And it's called the Daffodil Principle. I've had more businessmen tell me that this has changed their lives. And it's very similar to uh, the vector principle. Uh, but in summary, it talks about learning to use the accumulation of time. And the principle says, when we multiply tiny pieces of time with small increments of daily effort, our lives will change dramatically. Again, it works like compound interests. I only wish I'd known this when I was 21 because that's when compound interest really can work its wonders. 30, 40, 50 years. So I'll leave you with this thought. If you want an exceptional life, if you want a life of excellence, if you want to be the very best that you can be, you have to walk down certain paths that most people are unwilling to walk down. But if you do, it'll make all the difference in the quality of your life, and it'll make all the difference in your company and its performance. Thank you.